Good morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you're watching this video. It's Dr. Richardson, Lecture 4. We are moving up the levels of organization of matter, and today our lecture is all about cells. Now, what biologists know about cells is enclosed within the cell theory. And this theory states that all living things are made of one or more cells. Cells are the smallest structural and functional unit of living organisms, meaning you never have an organism that's half a cell or a quarter of a cell. It's either one cell or a number of cells. It's the smallest unit, like the dollar bill is the smallest unit of paper money that we have. Next, the cell theory states that all cells arise or come from pre-existing living cells. There had to be, you know, a cell from which other cells come. And finally, cells carry the genetic information for an organism in the form of their DNA. And as I've said throughout the lecture so far, living organisms can either be made of one cell, and in some cases, trillions of them. We have many bacteria that are made of just one cell, but humans, 37 trillion cells. Now, we can um, list the jobs that cells do by using a mnemonic. We've used them before. We're going to use another one. And the mnemonic for what cells do, what their job is, is I-more. I-M-O-R-E. Cells interact with other cells. Cells make biological molecules. Uh, we can do the dehydration synthesis and the hydrolysis reactions that we talked about in lecture three to make these biological molecules, carbs and fats and proteins, obtain energy and nutrients. Cells have to be able to do that or else they won't be alive. Cells reproduce through a cell division process that we call mitosis. I'm going to talk about that in this lecture. And cells also e eliminate waste. So please remember I more. And what are the things that cells do? Now, I want to a little remember here for a minute. Recall two types of cells, prokaryotic cells, cells that have no nucleus. The DNA is just kind of floating around in the cytoplasm, the liquidy stuff inside the cell. Prokaryotic cells are found in archaea and bacteria kingdoms only. We focus more on eukaryotic cells, because that's what we're made of. And eukaryotic, again, cells that have a nucleus, and the DNA is contained within the nucleus. We call the nucleus an organelle, which is a small compartment. And animal, plant, fungi, and protist kingdoms contain eukaryotic cells. picture for you, prokaryotic cell, DNA, just kind of hanging out inside. This is a eukaryotic animal cell. The purple is the nucleus where the DNA is. And this is a eukaryotic plant cell. We will study plants at the end of our course, and here's the nucleus here with the DNA inside. So just reminding you again of the different types of cells, and we are going to focus again on eukaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells, complex, very complex. I would propose you think of eukaryotic cells like a factory with many different departments, many different rooms. And uh, the factory, it's not just one big room. There's different areas where different jobs are being taken out, are being undertaken, and the whole factory acts as a unit to put out whatever the product is. We today are going to look at the different cell parts and what their purpose is, what their function is, and what they do. 
And you can see here, it's a crude drawing, but we're going to learn what all these little things are today. And uh, cells can look very different. Here's a picture of an animal cell. There's a plant cell. Fungal cell and fungi. Here's a protist cell. But all of these cells, while they look extremely different, have similar parts. And this is your bread and butter for this lecture, a list of very important cell parts. We're going to learn a little bit of detail about each one. I've also made a table here on the left. And you might want to use, I would recommend you use the table since it's already made for you and gives you the important information, purpose and function for each part. We're going to go over the table and over the PowerPoint and put it all together. Let's start with parts that are on the surface of the cell, the outside of the cell. And we're going to start with the extracellular matrix, also called ECM. Now you need to think of ECM like external scaffolding. You've all seen buildings as they're being built and they put the scaffolding around the outside so the workers can you know, build the outside of the building and stuff. So ECM is a lot like that external outside scaffolding. And ECM is proteins and carbohydrates that hold cells in place. You know, you do this to your skin and the skin doesn't fall off. So the ECM holds cells in place. The exact makeup of the ECM can be different depending on the cell or tissue type. The ECM does more complicated stuff like helping to transmit cell sing signals. But what I want you to remember is that the ECM is external support and holds cells in place. Here's a cell inside of the cell, a cell membrane outside of the cell, and all these little uh, spidery looking things and, and these brown things that look like worms and these purple things, all ECM, proteins that hold cells in place. Got to have stuff held in place. Another part of the cell, a very important part of the cell, is the PM, the plasma membrane. This is the actual membrane of the cell. It holds all the cell stuff inside, the walls, if you will, of the cell. The structure of the PM plasma membrane is very unique. It has two layers, so sometimes it's called a bilayer, bi meaning two, and this bilayer is made up of proteins and phospholipids. The proteins, there's fewer of them, but different types. And the proteins kind of float in this sea of phospholipids. And phospholipids are lipids with a phosphate molecule attached to it. You'll see a picture of it in a minute. The plasma membrane is the gatekeeper of the cell. It says what can come in and what goes out. It keeps the stuff in that it wants and it keeps the stuff out that it doesn't want. So the plasma membrane has a very important job. It regulates the flow of material in and out. It separates the inside of the cell from the external environment outside of the cell. It also participates in communication. Uh, that's a bit more of a complicated job. But what's really interesting is you can have 10,000 layers of plasma membrane, not even as thick as a piece of paper. Fascinating. It, biology never ceases to fascinate me. So plasma membrane, super, super thin, but very powerful, does a lot of jobs. Here's a picture of the plasma membrane. <clears throat> and the blue things are the proteins. The green things are the phospholipids. So the phospholipids are like a sea or an ocean, and the proteins kind of float in this ocean of phospholipids. 
Now, in the plasma membrane, those proteins floating around, there are thousands of them on the surface of every single one of your cells. And the, there are, the proteins have three important jobs I want you to remember. Some of the proteins are receptor proteins. They receive or catch molecular signals from other cells, usually hormones. And receptor proteins catch the signal and then the cell will respond in a certain way. For example, uh, there might be a receptor protein that catches a molecular signal that tells that cell, hey, you need to divide now. You need to do mitosis and divide. Or the signal might be, hey, cell, you need to make a protein for us. So receptor proteins catch signals and then the cell will respond in some way. Another type of protein in the plasma membrane are recognition proteins. These are like ID tags on the outside of a cell. And they're very important to our immune system because our immune system will kill anything it thinks is not us. Bacteria that we get sick from, viruses, things like that. So it's important that every cell that is yours, that's supposed to be in your body, has a recognition protein to say, hey, I'm Terry, please do not kill me, immune system, I belong here. And finally, transport proteins. Within the plasma membrane, some of those proteins allow molecules to move in or out of the cell. Let's show you a couple pictures. Here's a receptor protein. Here's your plasma membrane, phospholipids, proteins. And what this is showing is some kind of message, a molecule is going to come in, land on that receptor protein, and then some response will come from the cell. Here's a recognition protein hanging out. It has this little molecule on the end. And again, that's just identifying Hey, I'm me. I'm Terry. Please do not kill this cell because I belong here. And finally, transport proteins. Here's the outside of the cell called extracellular space. Here's the inside of the cell, intracellular space. Here's all these green things that want to come inside, but how do they get inside? Well, these transport proteins can actually act as little tunnels to help stuff get inside the cell and others can like catch things and spit them out inside so transport moving stuff from outside into the cell transport proteins all right again the uh, structure of the plasma membrane it's called the phospholipid bilayer two layers of phospholipids stacked together. Each phospholipid has a head and two tails. And the two layers are structured in a very unique way, where the tails face each other and the heads face inside and outside of the cell. Let me show you a picture. Here is one single phospholipid. It has a head and two tails, and the way the bilayer is set up is the heads are facing out inside of the cell and outside of the cell, and the, the tails touch in the middle. You don't see any proteins here because this slide is specifically just to show you the structure of the phospholipids. One just added piece of info is the head of the phospholipid is hydrophilic attracted to water, interacts, does chemical reactions with water, but the tails are hydrophobic, will not interact with water. So there's your plasma membrane. Again, one more complete picture. Phospholipid bilayer, two layers. There's one layer, here's the other. Heads and heads on the outside and inside of the cell, tails touching in the middle. 
and then the proteins, receptor proteins, recognition proteins, transport proteins, kind of floating around in the sea of phospholipids. Very, very, very complicated. All right. Next, we are going to talk about the final part of the cell that's outside of the cell or on the surface of the cell, and that's cilia or flagella. Now, both cilia and flagella are hair-like structures on the surface of some cells. Not every cell has cilia, not every cell has flagella, just some. Cilia are smaller than flagella, but both of them help the cell to either move itself or to cause stuff to move past the cell. And uh, let's show you a couple of examples. Um, they move a little different. So flagella kind of move in a propeller-like way, and cilia kind of beat back and forth, very interesting ways of movement. But cilia, for example, are on the surface of cells in our lungs. And what they do is they kind of, they're like kind of, you know, branches of the tree that kind of blow in the breeze, and they help to move stuff past your cells. Keep it moving. Um, an example of flagella, a great example, is sperm. Uh, you've all seen pictures of sperm. It has a head and it has this tail, and the, the sperm will swim up the vagina and hopefully um, fertilize an egg, but the little tail is a flagella and helps that cell, sperm cell, to move. So cilia and flagella both assist in cell movement, movement of some kind. All right, now we're gonna move and talk about structures that are inside the cell, inside the cell. And let's start by talking about cytoskeleton. If the ECM is external support and scaffolding, cytoskeleton is internal support. So the cytoskeleton is proteins, and they're these protein fibers that give the cell its internal support and shape. Without cytoskeleton, a cell would just be a a collapsed bag of water. Can't have that. We've got to have it, you know, in a specific shape so that all the stuff can work inside. So cytoskeleton, think of it as internal support, protein fibers that give the, the cell its shape. Next, we have cytoplasm. And cytoplasm is technically defined as everything inside the cell but we can divide the cytoplasm into cytosol, gel, liquidy stuff inside the cell, and organelles, compartments where cells perform specific chemical reactions. And again, you have to think of the cell as that the huge factory, the organelles are the different rooms or buildings where different duties or jobs are carried out. So one more time, cytoplasm is everything inside the cell, but you further divide cytoplasm into cytosol, the liquidy part, and the organelles, which are the compartments or rooms where the business of the cell is done. And now we're gonna talk next about several organelles. What do organelles do? Well, they help separate different chemical reactions. We can't have all the chemical reactions happening in the same spot. We blow up, preventing material that shouldn't be mixing together from mixing, allow several reactions to occur at one time. There can be hundreds of chemical reactions happening at any given second in any given cell. This obviously makes the cell more efficient. And there is a way of moving stuff around. Each cell has its own uber system. 
and these are called vesicles, little sacs that carry stuff around to different organelles. So vesicles. If we're in this organelle and we want to get to this organelle, we just package whatever we need to move into a little vesicle and it gets over here. And then if we want to get something from here outside the cell, we package it up in a little vesicle and we send it wherever it needs to go. So vesicles are like Uber cars that move stuff around the cell. All right, here are our main organelles that we're going to talk about. We'll show you a slide for each one and follow along on the table here. Centrioles. Centrioles are these little things. I always thought they looked like little logs. <laughs> and there's two centrioles in each cell, and they help out with mitosis, cell division. And we're going to learn more about mitosis in a few minutes. We'll talk more in detail. But the centrioles help to pull apart chromosomes. When you want to make two cells, the first thing you have to do is duplicate, make a copy of each chromosome, and then you have to pull the chromosomes apart to go into each cell. So centrioles assist, help out with mitosis, cell division. Next, we have the endoplasmic reticulum. I always impressed my friends when I was a college student saying big words like that. The ER, or endoplasmic reticulum, is a group of membranes in the liquidy cytosol, and a very important thing happens in the ER. Proteins are made here. Now, we're going to talk exactly about how proteins are made in Lecture 8, but for now, I need you to remember, endoplasmic reticulum, proteins made in the ER, and then they are carried to the Golgi by vesicles. And that's what's actually happening here. This is the ER, this is the Golgi, and these are proteins that were made and they're being transported to the Golgi. Golgi, named after the guy who discovered it, is sometimes called an apparatus and sometimes called a complex, whatever. If you know Golgi, you're good because there's nothing else called Golgi. This is another set of membranes, kind of like the plasma membrane. And what happens in the Golgi is I want you to think of it as like the post office. The protein that's been made in the ER, endoplasmic reticulum, is taken to the Golgi and it's packaged and processed so that the protein is ready to go and off and do its job. So Golgi is like the post office. Proteins made in the ER are taken to the Golgi and they're modified chemically, complicated chemical reactions we don't need to know, but you want to think of them as they're modified, packaged up, and sent off to where they need to go. Your cells are making proteins all the time. Those proteins need to go where they need to go to do their job, and it's the job of the Golgi to package them up and get them ready to go. Now, when proteins are made in the ER and processed and packaged in the Golgi, they're carried to one of three places. The protein made will either be used within that same cell, the protein made will go to the plasma membrane, maybe it has a job there, or that protein will be sent outside of the cell completely. And that is kind of what this picture is showing. So we have our endoplasmic reticulum, proteins are being made, they're carried by vesicles to the Golgi, modified chemically, packaged up, and in this case the job of the protein is to leave the cell and go do something outside of that cell. It doesn't show it in this picture, but just as easily that protein could be taken 
used some other place within the same cell, or the protein could be have a job in the plasma membrane itself. Because remember, there's lots of proteins in the plasma membrane. All right. Next, we have an organelle. That's the trash man or the trash lady. However, I'm not going to specify a gender, but lysosomes clean up stuff. They'll break down food particles. They'll recycle worn out organelles. So kind of like the trash guy, cleaning up the mess. Uh, and, you know, cells have waste products and stuff like that, and organelles wear out. So we got to clean that stuff out. And that's what lysosomes will do. Here is showing a lysosome taking in a food particle and the way that the lysosome will clean it up is it will digest that food using enzymes. Here is a damaged organelle and you see this lysosome has engulfed it, taken it in, and it's squirting it with enzymes and it's going to break it down. Nothing's ever wasted though. If we break something down to a monomer, we can always use it again to make a polymer later on. So uh, we don't waste a lot of stuff in the bottom, which is good. Next, we have the mitochondria. Mitochondria is called the powerhouse of the cell because it's in the mitochondria where we make ATP. We will learn more about ATP in lecture six and seven, but it is an energy carrier that carries the energy to where the cell needs it. Now, depending on what type of cell it is, you might have a lot of mitochondria or you might have a smaller number of mitochondria. For example, muscle cells. We use our muscles every day. Lots of mitochondria in there because we need to be able to do this, right? But for example, in the cartilage that holds your muscles and bones together, not as much mitochondria there because we don't, you know, run with our cartilage. We run with our muscles. So depending on the cell of the body, there might be a lot of mitochondria or there might be less. Again, the mitochondria it looks like kind of like a kidney bean that's all uh, wrinkled up. That's where fuel sources like glucose, uh, carbohydrates and fats can go in and we can make ATP. Powerhouse of the cell, ATP is made in the mitochondria. And finally, the nucleus. You can consider this like, um, like the Bayramian Hall of CSUN. It's, the, it's the, the main area where all the action is, the administration, the president of the company sits in the nucleus. This is the brain of the cell. The DNA, as you know, is in the nucleus, and the DNA is the blueprint or the instructions for making that cell and the entire body and also the instructions to do all of the chemical reactions needed in that cell. So, nucleus again, zooming in, there's our DNA, and you might remember that structure from the last lecture when we talked about nucleic acids. All right, please use the table. Some people like to redo the table, write it in your own words. Maybe you want to use some flashcards or something, but very important to know these different parts of the cell and their purpose and function. This was my hand-drawn picture about the proteins in the plasma membrane Again, one more before we leave. We have receptor proteins, can catch chemical messages. We have recognition proteins, identify that cell as, hey, this is me, I belong here, don't kill me, immune system. 
and transport proteins that can move stuff in and out of the cell. Three types of plasma membrane proteins. And here's just my best attempt at a picture of an entire cell with all of the stuff inside. So, you see, we talked about the nucleus, cytoplasm, the liquid stuff, plus the organelles. We talked about the endoplasmic reticulum proteins are made. The Golgi proteins are packaged up. Once proteins leave the Golgi, they can either go to work inside the cell somewhere. They can go to the PM, the plasma membrane. Maybe they have a job in the plasma membrane. Or those proteins can go outside of the cell. Here's your ECM, external scaffolding. There's your centrioles, your lysosomes, your mitochondria. Don't forget the plasma membrane, the gatekeeper of this whole factory. Who can get in and who can't. Good stuff. All right. One last topic today we want to cover, and that is how do we make new cells? Your body is made out of trillions of cells, and cells divide by a process called mitosis, division of cells that produces daughter cells, parent cells, daughter cells, that are exact copies. Liver cells, lung cells, skin cells, hair cells, things like that. Now, don't confuse mitosis with meiosis. Meiosis is when we're making sperm and egg cells for when we're going to have babies. We're going to talk about that in lecture nine. Today, we're talking about mitosis. So mitosis happens in every cell of the body except ovaries and testes in males and females because that's where we do meiosis. So we'll cover that later. Now, when we're doing mitosis, every cell has a life cycle or a cell cycle, and it's going through this cell cycle its whole life. Sometimes it stops at a certain part in the cycle, but each cell has a cell cycle. And that cell cycle includes interphase, mitosis, and cytokinesis. Interphase, mitosis, cytokinesis. We'll go over the material here, look at some pictures, and then go over it again to make sure you caught it all. Now interphase, the cell is not divided. It's not doing mitosis. The cell is growing, growing. The DNA is going to be copied or replicated, getting ready for mitosis, but it's not dividing yet. It's not doing mitosis yet. Then the cell will do mitosis. This is when we're actually dividing into two cells. And there are four phases of mitosis. And then once that's finished, we have cytokinesis, where the cytoplasm, the liquidy juice and all the organelles, actually will split. So here is our overview of the cell cycle. Interphase, mitosis, four phases, and cytokinesis. Picture, I'm going to go over it a few times. Interphase, nothing's happening yet, but the DNA is going to get copied. Then we have mitosis, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then cytokinesis, where the rest of the stuff will split off. And then we will finish and have two separate identical cells. All right, let's do it over again, a little bit more detail. 
here's a picture. Cell cycles are often um, drawn in a circular way. And what it's showing here is all of this green, yellow, and blue is interphase. See the white circle, interphase. So it's almost like from 11 p.m. all the way around like 8 p.m., is all interphase, just preparing for mitosis. And it looks like going from a lot, like 8 p.m. to maybe 11 p.m. is when the mitosis and the cytokinesis is happening. So a cell spends most of its time in interphase, growing, replicating DNA, copying the DNA, getting ready, then mitosis, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then cytokinesis, and then it'll go back to being an interphase, cell cycle. Another way of looking at it, interphase, not much is happening at first, but we do copy the DNA. We go from one full set of DNA, 46 chromosomes, to double that. Then we do mitosis, DNA is dividing, pulling apart. And then we have cytokinesis where the rest of the cell juice and, and organelles finally divides. And we end with two cells identical. All right, let's go through it one more time. Interphase, cells growing, DNA is copied. Remember, DNA is your blueprint, the cell's blueprint, the organism's blueprint for making everything that it needs. How does DNA replicate? Well, DNA replicates using enzymes. And there is a very important enzyme called DNA polymerase that is the main enzyme that helps DNA to replicate. It's actually a lot more complicated, but let's make it easy. DNA polymerase, remember that double helix, it opens up that double helix so that we can make copies. DNA poly polymerase opens up the molecule. We have these single monomers of nucleic acids hanging out and they will come together, get knitted together to make new DNA copies. So the result is we'll have two complete double strands of DNA of each chromosome, and they'll be connected together called sister chromatids. Here we go. Here's our DNA, DNA polymerase, the green uh, things, enzymes, and they're opening up. So the DNA is now unwound. Then these Nucleotides, A's and T's and C's and G's, remember that, are going to come in and they're going to start making a new double strand, one here and one here. And so the result then is we go from one double strand, it's opened up, you don't see DNA polymerase here so that it can illustrate that we're actually going to end with two DNA molecules. And what you notice if you look really close is the red we call the parent strand, the original strand. And what's made then is the purple strand, the new strand, the daughter strand that will bond with the parent strand. But that's a brand new full DNA and another one. And one more picture just to make sure you've got it. This is our DNA, our strand, and it gets wound up into a chromosome. And when DNA is replicated, we now have two chromosomes. And they're kind of hooked together there by something called a centromere. And this is a sister chromatid right here. Unduplicated, not replicated. DNA polymerase comes, opens it up daughter strands made. Now we have two of them and they're hooked together. And then what mitosis does is breaks those apart. And each of these will go into 
a new cell. All right, good. Here's the mitosis part. And mitosis itself, four phases. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, using the mnemonic PMAT. PMAT. Oh, I don't, can't tell you how many times we studied that as biology majors. Let's take a little bit of a closer look, though, at what's happening. What happens in prophase is the nucleus breaks down. So here we're in interphase, and here's our nucleus right here. Here's prophase. See those white? The, the nucleus itself is breaking apart. What we also find happening is these microtubules are forming. The microtubules help pull the chromosomes apart. So in prophase, microtubules are forming and the nucleus breaks down. Now we move to metaphase. In metaphase, the duplicated chromosomes are going to line up, lining up in the middle of the cell. And these microtubules, which come from centrioles, are attaching to the chromosomes. Anaphase, duplicated chromosomes are separated. So you see the sister chromatids that used to be together are now getting pulled apart. And then finally, in telophase, new, new nucleus, nuclei, nucleuses, one new nucleus is forming here to enclose this DNA, one new nucleus is forming here. So please be familiar with what's happening in each stage of mitosis. And again, cytokinesis is just dividing up the rest of the stuff. It's like when you get a divorce and you have to divide up the rest of the stuff in the house, right? You take that mitochondria and I'll take this one. You take that endoplasmic reticulum and I'll take this one. You take those lysosomes and I'll take this one. So the rest of the stuff in the cell also gets divided up. And there you have it. This is a great little mitosis video. I urge you to pause and watch this video or watch it in a minute after I'm done speaking. Uh, here's Mr. Anderson. He's got a nice little video about all the different cell parts. If he might do it a little bit better than me, so you might want to watch his video as well. I like Mr. Anderson. He's good reinforcement. Hear it again, hear it in a little bit different way. Always helps with studying. Another good cell video, the Amoeba Sisters. They make really cute videos. I like their cell video again. Just another way of looking at it. Animations might help to understand. And finally, this video that I'm making, well, you'll also have a link to it here at the end of the lecture. So there you have it. Lecture four. Catch you next time.